Now it's a big pleasure, Professor Dr. Eike Weber, Fraunhofer ISE. Um, you know I never do a big introduction because you can read the bios online, but he's uh, the, the grandfather of the German solar industry and still a young man. Welcome. Well, uh, <laughs> hello, good morning, everybody. Um, after this quite uh, sad story of Bart, I must say I try to give a more upbeat story now because really the future of what we are talking about, the green economy, is absolutely sure. The only question is who will be the winners. And Bart, I'm delighted to, to see the guy who supports my good friend Lars Samuelsen in Lund because I think he is really the spirit behind GLOW and he is doing an extremely good uh, job. Okay. Uh, I would like to talk about the future of the solar industry. We all know what big problems we have right now, but I hope I can give you a more upbeat uh, uh, view down the road. Uh, first, let me introduce to you my institute. The Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems, as you can see here, is not just an institute on photovoltaics. We are working on technologies all across the green space. I always say it's easier to define what we are not working on. We are not working on wind energy because this is done by another Fraunhofer Institute in Kassel. We are not working on geothermal energy. We do very little on biomass. But all the other technologies which we need for the transformation of our energy system, this is part of our work. And what is very specific to Fraunhofer is that we have to find our own money. We have only 10% of our almost 80 million euros budget as basic financing. 90% we have to raise from contracts and we are very interested to work with industry. Actually, we are obliged to raise at least one third of our budget from industry contracts. So we are especially keen working with startups, small and medium sized companies, because we can offer to have the infrastructure to do proof of principle, to do uh, experiments to validate results and as I say we are very open to work together with you and when we have very interesting projects very often we are able to attract additional government funding so that the small company doesn't have to pay the whole bill you know leveraging the amount of money you have so if you are interested in working together we are very open uh, for this kind of discussion I think we all agree that the transformation of the energy system to a sustainable energy system is very urgent and imminent. It's not only the shortage of fossil fuels, it is as well the danger of climate change. And I don't want to waste time. I think we all agree. And we have to start with using energy much more efficiently than we do it. We have to build up and develop all kinds of renewable energy. We don't talk about wind versus solar versus the other ways to uh, create uh, energy and uh, usable energy in a renewable way. We have to use all of them. We have to develop storage technologies because if we rely more and more on wind and solar, we have to think about what we do when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. And of course, the electricity grid is used to transport electricity from centralized power stations to the consumer. The future grid will work in both directions and therefore there is work to be done and quite important work to be done. All of these things, and this is now a very important message, all of these things are being pushed forward in Germany. But all of these technologies will be needed globally in the next 50 years. So what we build up here, the technologies which we develop, will be not just for the German market, they will be very important for the worldwide market. Uh, and we've noticed, for instance, just an example in Saudi Arabia, in the Emirates, the interest in technologies developed here is enormous. The, process is always slow, they have enormous amounts of money, but of course they are very careful where to spend it. But this was something which is coming up very quickly. Just to give you an, a very impressive picture of what we are talking about in energy resources. You see on the right hand side of this red line are the fossil resources. And the unit which we are using here is a terawatt year which is 8,000 terawatt hours, and the terawatt hours is, of course, a billion uh, watt hours. And you see, these amounts of terawatt hours are very large compared to the annual consumption. We humans use 16 terawatt years 
per year as the energy consumption. 2050, we might need 28. And of course, you see coal, uranium, and even petrol can serve us for quite some years to come. We will not run out of the fossil fuels very soon. But of course, if we talk about the next 100 years, you see already we come into trouble relying on them. We have renewable sources. And to the left of the red line, all these numbers are annual numbers. We can harvest energy from the tides, geothermal, hydro, wind, all of this what is listed here. But all of the renewable sources completely pale in comparison with what the sun is delivering to us year by year. So the sun is the ultimate source of usable energy for humankind. And if we think about the year 2050, the year 2100, the year 2500. This is where we will use our usable energy from. And you see that sun and wind are perfect complements. These are real data from the German electricity grid. You see, if you have about similar amounts of electricity available from sun and from wind, it uh, goes together in a very well complementary way. In winter, you almost don't get electricity from the sun, but you have much more wind blowing. In summer, the wind is weaker, and the sun takes up the slack. And altogether, in Germany, we already harvest about six to seven terawatt hours per month uh, from the sources only sun and wind. And we just saw the number 23% of our electricity already comes from renewable sources. So what we need is really a triangle we need to have wind, we need to have sun, and we need to have the other renewables, which are available at any time, hydrogeothermal, biomass, and we have to connect it with the proper grid, which I said will be different than what we have today. And of course, we need storage technologies. Let me now concentrate on solar and the photovoltaics. I like to show this picture, which is an old picture from the year 2010, from the Sarrazin study of 2010. And in 2010, when we had a world market of about 15 gigawatts the annual installation, when Sarrazin predicted 2020, we might have a 100 gigawatt annual market, everybody thought these guys are crazy. These guys are overly optimistic. They had predicted 110 gigawatt in 2020, a 30 gigawatt market in 2014. But look what happened. Already today, we are far above the prediction of this, in quotation, optimistic Sarrazin study. So we have reached the, the 30 gigawatt market already in 2012, and we will probably be even above the 100 gigawatt market mark here by 2100. So although we have right now the big problems in the photovoltaic market with companies going bankrupt and all of the other problems, the outlook of the global PV market is enormously optimistic and positive. And even the rather conservative International Energy Agency had to correct their expectations. And they say by 2050, we uh, expect 3,000 gigawatts of installed PV power. It might be even more. I will show it later to you. But I think if even a conservative agency like IEA, which in the past was very close to fossil fuels, oil and gas, and so on, this shows you that we are really talking about a serious trend. And this is the graph. You have seen it in many different ways, which drives this all. One can use it. One can call it the Moore's law of photovoltaics. In contrast to Moore's law, we are not talking about the size of particles and transistors. We are talking about the cost. And the cost comes down following a learning curve. And most importantly, the axis on the learning curve is not time. We don't reduce the cost of these photovoltaic modules by simply waiting, we reduce it, and most powerful is by creating the market. And of course, we have seen that the price and uh, the cost and on the long run, the price comes down for, by 20% for each doubling of the globally installed quantity. And as a matter of fact, in the years 2006, 2008, people had speculated about the end of the learning curve, because in those years, the demand was so large that the prices did not come down. Companies simply could not produce enough modules to satisfy the world market. Now we are in the opposite situation. We have an oversupply, and prices are at the moment far below the uh, long-term learning curve. Therefore, we can safely predict that in the next 
coming 12 to 18 months, we will not see prices go further down. We might see stable prices, even slightly higher prices. And only when worldwide we have installed 300 gigawatts or so, we will be able to continue on the learning curve. But at current prices, we can produce solar electricity in Germany, in Alaska-type sunshine conditions of Germany for 10 to 12 cents per kilowatt hour. And if we take the same photovoltaic system and place it into North Africa or into the Emirates, we can get it for half the price because of the double sunshine. And this means 5 to 6 cents per kilowatt hour. For comparison, anybody in the world who makes electricity out of oil by burning diesel has to pay, the oil price is $100 per barrel, you need two barrels of oil for 1,000 kilowatt hours of electricity, which means any kilowatt hour created by a diesel generator means you burn oil for 20 cents per kilowatt hour. So worldwide, we can save today billions and billions of dollars by simply placing next to each diesel generator a solar field to take up what is needed during the day, save the diesel, let it run in the night when you still need electricity in the night, and in this way we have enormous market potential. And this is the reason why I'm so optimistic that these incredible growth curves will continue as I have showed it before. What are we talking about? There's a lot of nonsense talk about second and third generation of photovoltaics. Don't forget, the photovoltaics is crystalline silicon. 90% of the huge world market is crystalline silicon, either single crystal or multi-crystalline silicon, and the share of uh, thin film is down to less than 10% today because of the low prices of crystalline silicon. The poor guys producing thin film panels have a tough time to compete. The efficiency is lower, and if the price is higher, so why should anybody buy their product? So this is the current situation worldwide. And you see it here on the learning curve. The thin film guys are following as well the learning curve. They are doing fine. But of course, their problem is the total installed amount is so much lower. And of course, today, the price differential has disappeared because of the oversupply in the crystalline silicon market. So in order to compete, the thin film guys simply have to come to similar efficiencies as crystalline silicon, which means module efficiencies above 15 percent. And at the moment, there is no such product on the market. But of course, one should not give up hope. Things can still develop in this direction. In crystalline silicon, there's still enormous potential of further innovation R&D. I just show you one example. I could show you uh, a whole dozen of slides of different new designs where we improve the efficiency with cost-effective production technologies. As a matter of fact, we have a whole a whole portfolio of future technologies, all these acronyms you can find here explained, which might be introduced in the future to decrease production cost and increase the yield, the efficiency. So uh, crystalline silicon, this good old 20, 30 years old technology, still is enormously innovative at the forefront of many developments. In my institute, I have about 150 people just working in the improvement of crystalline silicon photovoltaics. However, we are not stuck with crystalline silicon because crystalline silicon can only harvest a part of the solar spectrum. We want to harvest more of the solar spectrum, and we can do it by stacking different materials on top of each other, like these three, five materials on a germanium substrate shown here. Such kind of a stack is extremely exp expensive to make. You know, the structures are very similar to the structures of a semiconductor laser. You have different materials, you have different doping. It has to be in P and N type of each of the materials. You have to have so-called tunnel diodes so that the current goes through all of this enormously expensive technology, much too expensive for terrestrial applications. These technologies were actually developed for space solar cells because if you put solar cells into space, you don't ask for the price per watt, you ask for the watt per kilogram of solar cells, and there you get the most. However, 
we can make a trick to use it on the Earth. We simply take a wafer, cut it into thousands of tiny, tiny solar cells, place it below a collecting lens, and now all the light of the large area is converted with the high efficiency of that structure into, uh, into energy. And actually, we just announced a new record efficiency of a four-junction cell. It is not a world record. The world record by now is 44%, and we reached 43.6%, a very innovative new technology where we use wafer bonding. And this is done in collaboration with a company which bought our startup. We founded Concentrix as a startup using this technology. Uh, Concentrix needed money. Siemens, Bosch, they were not interested, but the French company Soitec, they bought the company, and together with Soitec, now we develop the wafer bonding technology. We deposit on two different substrates, two different uh, two junction devices, and then we bond it together in such a perfection that the current can go through the interface. It's a real technology feed, and I can predict you will soon hear numbers far be above this number as new world record efficiencies. And of course, this is a technology which is very environmentally friendly. You can even still use it for agriculture below. You have to place these modules on two axis trackers to follow the sun, and Concentrix is now building in California, which is at the moment the world's largest PV plant with 300 megawatt power. It could be when the plant is ready uh, that you have other even larger PV plants coming up. So altogether, solar cell market is divided in five different technologies. The ones who are of real commercial interest are within this red dot because organic dye nanostructure cells, these are still very much R&D topics, but the R&D is important. We work on it. Actually, we work as well with Lars Samuelson on a nanowire type of solar cells, but it's not yet there, it's not yet in the market, but it has great potential. It's an R&D topic. Uh, main uh, mainstay is, of course, crystalline silicon. Thin films, big problem if the efficiencies don't come up. But this one is another coming technology, very exciting to watch in the future. One word about uh, concentrating solar power, the solar thermal harvesting of solar energy for electricity. Some time ago, uh, concentrated solar thermal power was less expensive than PV. Therefore, everybody said in sun-rich areas we should create electricity with solar thermal parabolic mirror type of plants. But today, the price fight has been lost by solar thermal. Photovoltaic electricity is about half the price as electricity from the solar thermal uh, generators. The big advantage of solar thermal still is you can store heat more easily than electricity. So to provide electricity around the clock, they do have a case. Wind, by the way, is still less expensive than PV in Germany. These are German situations. However, uh, we are catching up, and the learning curve of wind is as well only half the slope of the learning curve of PV. Another issue is, of course, we need to secure electricity supply around the clock. So that means we need to work on the grid. We need to uh, use smart grids to shift loads, demand side management, and we need storage, short-term storage, seasonal storage. Not the topic of my talk, but not to forget in the big picture. And of course, for storage, we have many different approaches, mechanical, electrochemical, depending on what you need, for how long time you need it, and how much power. Very interesting emerging markets, and I saw Wellington is as well well aware of this situation too. So let's uh, summarize. What is the global situation right now? The global situation right now is that we, and we means really as well the German supplier companies, have helped to build up a gigantic overcapacity, at least two times the current PV market. And this means the prices which we have today are not dumping prices. The Chinese would be crazy to sell the output of 60 gigawatt of production capacity at low prices only to disturb 3 gigawatt of production capacity in Germany. No, it's just market. If you have double the production volume of the market, then prices have to come down. Companies who are short of cash will sell their modules at any price to generate cash and to stay afloat. 
Nearly all manufacturers along the food chain sell photovoltaics with a loss right now, and that's not a good business model on the long run. We are clear. And this means we have as well quality problems creeping in. Companies cutting edges in order to uh, save costs can uh, produce modules with lower quality. And of course, we have the uh, uh, news from protective tariffs. I am, as you might have noticed, very much against this type of things. Uh, and of course, we have this consolidation. Consolidation is a very nice word for insolvencies, takeovers, mergers, and so forth. But of course, this will be a temporary situation. In the long run, we will need to, uh, at the moment, we don't have any need for capacity expansion. So not only PV companies are suffering, but as well the companies who make the equipment, because they simply don't have orders, and only those can survive who have another field of business outside the PV business. The long-term outlook, on the other hand, as I already told you, is very good. And my back-of-the-envelope calculation, if I just conservatively say we need 10% of our energy from PV in the year 2050, it means 2050 we need to have 12,000 gigawatt installed, which is even four times as much as the prediction of the International Energy Agency. But of course, with today's market, it needs hundreds of years to reach this value. So it doesn't need a big analyst with huge computers to predict what we have as a PV market today is a small market compared to what we will have in 10 years. I always say we are now at about the year 1915 of automotive production, you know, where we have lots of companies, many of them will fail, a few big ones will come out and be successful. We will move from a market of 30 gigawatts per year to a 300 gigawatt per year market probably by 2025. And of course, PV will become one of the most cost-effective ways to generate electricity, competitive with all other sources of electricity production. And what is now the future? Well, the current capacity uh, which supplies the record world market, uh, of course, will change because most of this capacity is not able to produce at today's market prices. I already uh, talked about concentrated solar thermal power, but this is the real problem. We will see a lot of fantastic production capacity being junked because if you can produce modules only for one euro per watt and the market price is 50 cents, 60 cents, it doesn't make any sense to continue using this capacity. And therefore, starting about next year, we will see the need for new, and I call it X gigawatt, X standing for a number between one and five, gigawatt scale production capacity using latest technologies fully automated so that we can produce at module prices below 50 cents per watt. I think for Europe it is an enormous challenge to stay ahead, to stay on top of this development, to provide the technologies for these X gigawatt factories. And of course, we definitely will need to build a reference plant in Germany, this, uh, not in Germany, in Europe. Uh, I call this project something like an Airbus of PV to make sure that Europe stays ahead in this very important merging technology. And this is what I wanted to tell you. Thank you so much for your interest. It's a great pleasure to be here at Equa Summit. Very, very, very nice uh, presentation. I have one question. Imagine I'm not me, but I'm Bart Markus, who uh, has decided to invest in a new solar startup company. Which technology should I put my first five million in to create um, the, the, best, the best new PV startup company? Which one? What is your well, recommendation? Uh, definitely be careful with third generation type of things. Let them pan <laughs> out first, show the numbers, show the, the things. Right now, one issue which is of great interest for me is to use alternative silicon. Because for the future PV, we need, alternate, we need silicon at gigantic amounts. You know, today, the world silicon market is about 280,000 tons annually. Out of mm -hmm. this, only 30,000 goes into 
electronics, the rest goes into PV. Mm -hmm. And if we have a 100 gigawatt market, we need 800,000 tons of silicon annually. And using the current process, which is called the Siemens process, with chlorides, with lots of dangerous chemistry, in my view, makes no sense. So I think the development of alternative silicon at the moment is a very exciting issue. The other issue is the more uh, efficient uh, solar cells, uh, modern technologies, these are really issues where we need hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's not the real startup type of situation because if you want to bring module prices down, you need to make scale factories. Scale, yeah. That's more an issue for the European Investment Bank and all those guys, you know. <laughs> but uh, at the moment, right now, in the third generation, lots of research is going on, and I'm sure out of this research come very exciting technologies. It's the organic solar cells, the dye-sensitized solar cells, the nanostructured solar cells, and as soon as they can prove the principle, as soon as they can show that they have a place in the market, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. One question from you for Eike Weber. Uh, you mentioned quickly um, stack cells and, and the possibility yes. for very high efficiency yes. cells. Um, how far away do you think, there, there's research going on you know, all over the place, including University of New South Wales, how, how far from market do you think this technology oh, is? It's on the market. It's on the market, you know. The beauty of this technology is the concentrated PV modules are on the market right now. Just this year, I expect we will have about 100 megawatts of new installations built, tiny compared to the 30 gigawatts of the silicon market, but of course huge compared to what we had two years ago when it was a two megawatt market. The beauty is the technology to make these concentrating modules is there, and any advancements of the cell can be placed into the latest technology within a couple of weeks, you know, because you only take one cell technology instead of the other. So this is developing very rapidly, uh, but of course it is right now still the dark horse technology. 100 megawatt is still much, much less than the current uh, traditional synfilm technologies. But when all of these developments are going into the market quickly because the production technology, automated production and so on is already there. Mm -hmm.